Here's an excerpt from the memoir in progress. When I was 21 years old, I got expelled from Reed College. Well, Reed didn't use the word expelled. They called it graduating, but it came to the same thing. I was told to move along now, move on. I had been in the United States for six years at that point, but had spent all of those years as a dirt poor scholarship student, Afghan scholarship student, living in expensive and luxurious private schools, surrounded by the sons and daughters of the rich and very rich. Now, having graduated from college, I lived in plain old Portland, and honor demanded that I even tell my mother to stop sending me the $20 a week she'd been sending me. I was a big boy now, I told her. I could take care of myself. Actually, I was still a very small boy. I had no money, no source of money, and no idea how to make money. I had graduated from one of the country's finest small colleges, but all I had studied there were ideas. All I knew how to do was think, and all I knew how to be was a student. At being a student, I was very good. In those last days, Reed heaped honors and awards on me and nominated me for prestigious fellowships. Every element of my life screamed at me to go to graduate school, get an advanced degree in critical theory, and enter academia. But the existential absur absurdity of it made me shiver. What was the point of going to school to become a college professor who could then teach others how to become college professors, who would then teach others how to become college professors? How is this not a Ponzi scheme? <laughs> To get out of the ac academia scam. I had to do something real. This was the only thing I knew for sure. After six years in America, however, the only professionals I had seen up close were college professors. I had no idea what anyone else did for a living out there. Writing was my passion, but the only writing work I knew about that paid was journalism. I was no journalist, but I wrote to the Oregonian and asked if they would hire me. Some editor invited me to come chat with him. It wasn't a job interview. He just wanted to give me some sage advice. He was an extremely aged guy, one foot in the grave. In short, 20 or 30 feet younger than uh, 20 or 30 years. <laughs> in short, 20 or 30 years younger than I am now. He told me there were no openings at the Oregonian and never would be for a guy like me. To get a job at an important paper like that, I would have to clock a few years at a smaller place, getting my feet wet. In fact, he knew of one such place right now. Then he looked guilty, and I knew his suggestion was going to be bad. He steeled himself and put it out there. The nuclear reactor at Mount St. Helens is looking for someone to help them with public relations. <laughs> if you're interested. Work as a flack for the nuclear power industry? Had I fallen so low that I would make my living telling lies for Satan? Not for me, I said politely. I didn't think so, he admitted. Well then, your only other choice would be to contact some small town newspaper. The one in the Dallas might be willing to give you a shot if you don't mind starting at the bottom. The Dalles, yes, the was part of the name, was a small town 60 miles east of Portland, surrounded by ranches. I pictured the cowboys there roping me and cutting off my hair, and I knew what would happen next. I had seen deliverance. <laughs> it wasn't for me. That left jobs in Portland. I peered through the classified ads every day. I called, I wrote, I went out, but I couldn't find a job. I don't mean a job in my field. What field? I'd been a literature student. No one was getting cash to comment on literature. I was looking for any job, in quotes. It never occurred to me to look for work that might require a college degree. I assumed jobs like that would be too hard to get since everyone would want them. So when people asked what kind of work I was seeking, I said anything. The theory being that if I were the least picky, I would be the most employable. Actually, since anything is a job for which anyone qualifies, the competition for such jobs tends to be intense, especially in hard times like the recession of 1970. The odds of getting a job that only a few people can do is better for those few who can do it. 
But in the summer of 1970, this logic eluded me. So I applied to sell life insurance, file papers, haul boxes, all turned me down. I applied to work at a pickle factory, but the manager felt I was not pickle factory material. <laughs> I tried to get work at a garment factory, a furniture plant, a junkyard, no go. I applied for day laborer jobs, digging sewer lines. I got up at the crack of dawn, but scores of people had lined up ahead of me, even for those jobs. And anyone who looked more muscular than me, which is to say anyone, always got the nod. So I went to an employment agency. They had me fill out a form. I sat in their waiting room for two hours. At last, a counselor could see me. I made my way to a cubicle of a room and took a seat across a desk from a blonde woman in a red polyester suit. She had hair, sh uh, she had hair done up in a fashionable bob and hair sprayed into place. She wore nylons and lipstick and earrings. She looked nothing like girls did in real life. Women like her I had seen only in magazines, movies, and TV shows. I was aware that in some universe of aesthetics quite alien to me, this peculiar platinum-headed creature would be labeled attractive. Her body language told me she was pretty certain of her own allure. But being so close to one of these creatures in real life made me uneasy. I was nervous about the possible cancer-causing effects of the many chemicals so obviously fake <laughs> onto, her, onto her face and possibly her body. She smelled of sprays, deodorants, colognes, and other noxious industrial products. She seemed to find my substances somewhat noxious too, from the way she kept curling her nostrils. Wriggling uncomfortably on her pantyhose bottom, she studied the form I had filled out. So you went to, she squinted and looked closer, Reed College, it says here. What is that, a junior college? <laughs> no, it's a four-year college. I see. What did you study there? It says here, literature. What is that, like literature from different companies or, or what? Or how to write literature for all the different companies? No, not how to write it so much, more what's great about it. Authors. <laughs> Authors. She had no handle for that one. Well, what, what company's literature have you studied? No, no, not the literature of companies. We studied real literature, like War and Peace, you know, George Eliot, people like that, you know. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, you, you must have studied some business English. Business English? No. Accounting? No. Shorthand? No. What about bookkeeping? No. Let me see if I've got this straight, she said. You went to four years of college. You didn't pick up any accounting, no bookkeeping, and you can't even spell. I can spell, but you don't have any background in business English. Well, Mr. Ansari, she leaned forward and fixed me with her carefully penciled eyes. Did it ever occur to you that you just wasted four years of your life? <laughs> I was at a loss. Had I just wasted four years of my life? That question only makes sense if you have a destination. If you do, you can measure how much closer you've gotten to it each year. But I was only trying to stay alive and happy each day. From that perspective, my last four years had been very successful. I had explored cosmic ideas. I had smoked a lot of dope and taken a lot of acid. I had enjoyed transcendent love and incendiary sex for the last eight months, and I was still alive. <laughs> but now that those years were over, did it matter that they had ever been? Of all that I had gained in those four years, what did I still possess except my life? Thank you.